Well, another memorial conference for a great man. Um, I will, my, my talk will be in three parts. Um, one part I will talk to you about my intellectual travels with Nambu. Uh, second part I will show you a little bit of work having to do with what I would call Nambu-esque type approaches. And the last part will be a bunch of anecdotes and things like that. So I gave a talk pretty similar to that one without the physics in Osaka uh, a little while ago. So this is in memory of this great man. And um, as I s the reason this comes a little bit later, although not sooner than I expected, his first name, uh, is because in Japan of a certain time, Nambu is a famous name of a of a man who held a record for the long jump um, in the 1930s, Shu Pei Mao, uh, Nambu, excuse me. And, but this is the real Nambu. This is the long jump in physics. <laughs> so I would like to talk about several things. Well, Lars has already covered parts of it, so I don't have to, to do it, but I'll do it anyway, because half of you could not hear him, I think. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so my travels with Nambu start when the year after I entered graduate school, when uh, I was made aware of a particular paper on something called infinite component wave equations. Uh, the second time really happened at 1969 at uh, what was then NAL, National Accelerator Laboratory, and is now called Fermilab. Uh, and then at that point, I will, put in I will talk about three different types of physics. One is his APS lecture. I think it was in Chicago in January 1970. And then the famous Copenhagen lecture, Copenhagen lecture that Lars talked about. And then uh, Vortices in Paris in 1975, which is going to take me actually into, into a little bit of physics I want to talk about. And that's about it. So first contact, infinite multiplets. Uh, when I entered graduate school, um, I, was, I, w I entered graduate school to study general relativity, but I was soon turned because it looked like a very boring subject at the time. And, um, and I started being uh, George Sudarshan's uh, uh, student who told me to look at infinite component wave equations. In those days, there were all these states. And of course, people wanted to understand them in terms of one equation. And, uh, so Nambu, there's a p I was asked to read a, a paper by Nambu. And, and to use a, a um, Hungarian expression, I sweated blood in the process. I mean, Nambu's papers were never particularly easy. But in a particular paper that he wrote, in, uh, he wrote several papers, but in 1966, a uh, paper he wrote was uh, his reinvention of Majorana's equation. Majorana, in 1932, had written a paper on the in Majorana, there was a small interval between the Dirac equation and the discovery of the positron, in which, during which time uh, some people did not like at all the negative energy solutions, Majorana in particular. So he proposed a, uh, a new way of doing a, a Majorana equation where beta, which uh, was strictly positive, I mean, it's the, it was not a matrix, Okay. Well, it was a matrix, but it was not strictly positive. And it had infinite component uh, with a correlation between mass and spin. And uh, that, was, that was it. So I, and Nambu undoubtedly invented it without knowing it had been invented before. Because the way he did it, he mentioned in this paper, is extremely beautiful. In the introduction, he says, uh, there is um, a, 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 you know, there is a little known paper by, by Majorana. Okay. And, and he mentions that with grace in his introduction. And then in a footnote, he says, well, I thank professors Gurset and Cronin, not Jim Cronin, but the Cronin at, uh, 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 with uh, Feza, I think, and basically for pointing out to me this reference. So he clearly had done it, but of course, he, did not, he just wanted to make clear, but in a very most graceful way. And this is kind of is a window into the, in the, into the man. Okay. Now, fall of 1969, I arrive at, uh, uh, basically, at this laboratory, which did not exist, really. It was a hole in the ground, a circular hole in the ground. And uh, I meet Luc Lavelli. And Luc Lavelli had been a, a student uh, at uh, Chicago two years earlier. 
And, uh, and, uh, and by that time, I'd been very, getting very in interested in, in, uh, in Veneziano amplitudes and the like. And uh, the spectrum, I'd seen that, that kind of spectrum before. I did not know what it You know, I came from electrical engineering, so you see all kinds of funny things in there. Uh, and uh, Clavelli tells me, Nambu says it's a string. Oh, and then he says, would you like to meet Nambu? And I said, of course, of course. And I'll get back to that later, but this is our first uh, thing. And l later on, in, at the end of the talk, I talk about our, our memorable lunch at the Quadrangle Club. Um, so I want to start with a bunch of dual models, dual uh, resonance models, timelines, give you an idea. But this is only for, uh, it's a very narrow way of looking at it, but um, most of it will become relevant with respect to Nambu. So the first one is Dolenhorn Schmidt paper, which is much forgotten, but yet it is the one that started the whole thing, in, in a sense that pion nucleon amplitudes in the S channel, a lot of delta type resonances, T channel, rho exchange, therefore in a Regi view that gives you a particular contribution in the S channel, which happens to be more or less averages out to the resonance in the, in the S channel, and that was a big surprise. And therefore, that's why the community started writing amplitudes where S and T channels were automatically related. A year later, Veneziano, on the, on the way from, uh, from the Weizmann to CERN, uh, comes up with this um, amplitude. By the way, that amplitude had been looked for in a great, uh, by uh, Ademolo and company, Hector and, uh, and, and Miguel Grasso as well, etc. So there is, June 1969 is what Larch just um, basically uh, alluded to. That was the famous Wayne State meeting where he basically identifies it with a string. Not only that, but he also gives the coherent states and everything else, you know, okay? And then in, uh, in, in, I get to, um, to uh, uh, NAL. Uh, by the way, we had no senior advisors, so uh, it was important for us to really uh, uh, talk to somebody who was, who was senior. Um, Vera Soro, whom we had met, was at Wisconsin at the time, had come up with a lot of decoupling conditions, uh, namely that some amplitudes, um, some, op some, some modes of oscillators seemed to be able to decouple, but there was a problem with it, uh, namely that uh, it implied some sort of zero mass, uh, massless things, and of course that was a theory of strong interaction. But anyway, December 1969, that's going to give you a, a very quick timeline. And of course, a lot of work. This is not complete. Other people did things too, but this gives you an idea. Okay. So now let's talk about the January 1970 APS lecture. Okay. So right away, uh, he comes in and talks about what he called the DNA model, which was basically had hadrons, D DN and A. And, but what is most interesting is he understands the, the Vera Soro, uh, which was not an algebra at the time, because he says he, he right away focuses on the large amount of invariance property inherent in two-dimensional wave propagation. Of course, the young people, myself included at the time, had no idea what he was talking about. But he certainly knew. Okay? Veneziano model does seem to allow certain gauge transformation which can be utilized for this purpose. And then he says, this magic footnote, this transformation, not only is it proceedings, but footnotes, this, this transformation can be expressed in terms of the energy momentum tensor, which generate a Lie algebra when quantized. That's the Virasso algebra. It's the first time I think the algebra is actually mentioned, even though in the Copenhagen lecture he mentioned it explicitly. But then he talks about other stuff. Magnetic Dirac string between D and D bar. I mean, he's thinking about these things all the time. And th that is what's completely amazing. So I just wanted you to see. So these are things that he just throws in. Okay? But his mind is, is, a pff, is firing left and right. The next thing is this famous undelivered Copenhagen lecture. I'll tell you why later. It was not delivered, but uh, the, uh, the duality in hydrodynamics. So right away, as Lars says, there's a string action as an area, first, first time. The meaning of the diverse condition, which is a continuation of what he had said at the APS, and the VRSO algebra, no C number because we, were, we, didn't, uh, well, we didn't know how to commute things very well. Or if we did, we... Anyway, but as I said, 
he was kind of completely amazing because he goes on and he, and he offers in this, do, in this thing a lot of possible dynamical pictures of what's behind the string. Because he's, there is a, he has his DNA model, he has strings as linear TT bar chain or DD bar, strings as anti ferromagnet, he makes connection to the uh, easing, as Murray would say, model. Strings and monopoles talks about surface currents. And then he's very concerned about the slack MIT uh, results. Now, strings being uh, oscillators, you get Gaussian things. Okay? But, he, but that's certainly what, what not the data showed. And he was extremely worried about that. And he tried to make it fit. He introduced a fifth dimension and stuff like that. So it's kind of fascinating because he's, he keeps going, boom, 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 like this. And he tries to relate everything, while, while as most of us basically are focusing on one thing. But he has this, 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 this view, which is quite remarkable and endearing about him. I just wanted to mention that. So now let me go to the third thing, which is vortices in Paris. In 1975, we find ourselves uh, in Paris for a little conference. And uh, he, he has a contribution, of course, which uh, I, I urge you to look at. And he's talking about, in fact, Toru Eguchi is one of these persons uh, at the beginning, string, the magnetic confinement of, of, of the string. So, so the quarks would be monopole solutions of some sort of, of a QCD-like uh, theory, etc. cetera. And, uh, but then he didn't quite know how to proceed after that because it was an abelian model, basically what he had. Uh, then he talks about electric confinement, which has to do with this funny two-form, which naturally comes in string theory. And then he had used, actually, there's a, the, he had used a, a something called the London Ansatz. Then the London Ansatz was something that people pre-BCS theory knew, equating the current to the field, and that gave you a phenomenological description of the Meissner effect, although not gauge invariant, for sure as was pointed out. But he was thinking about doing it for form fields, okay? But then he ag again bemoaned the lack of a generalization uh, to, to the non-abelian case, and therefore doesn't know what to do with it. So now, if you permit me, I'm going to give you, I'm going to bore you, you can go to sleep, now I'm going to give you something about my obsession with the two-zero theory in six dimension, and maybe tell you something that perhaps you don't know, although I'm not sure, or maybe you don't want to know, or maybe you should not know. So let me start something which is the kinematics of eight bosons and eight fermions on the light cone. It's slightly different. Okay? So what happens is that once you have a bunch of operators, so you have four Grassmann variables and their derivatives, they obey these things. And then there's a Viking Carroll superfield, made in Sweden, I guess, which people used a long time ago. Some people, one of whom, one of whom is in the audience, used a long time ago to prove the finiteness, the perturbative finiteness of n equals four. And, and this, is, this, is, this is the thing, you expand it in that, and you have to use this funny variable. My, my, my hands do not... Yeah. I should, I should have a selfie thing. I put it... Oh, oh. Uh-oh. No, no, that's okay. Don't, don't. Theorists are not good at this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, okay, well... Should you be able to see this, you would see that this is where it is. Uh-oh, it's small. It has become small now. Does it mean half the signal is transmitted? I doubt it. Oh, God. Okay, look, I'm not touching it. No, 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 don't, don't. Thank you. Okay, so what happens, this is, this is the thing, and you have to have this fu funny dependence on this variable, which generalizes x minus, and then you have this field has all kinds of beautiful constraints, like for example, the, the photon in the n equals 4 uh, theory, the degrees of freedom appear here, and its conjugates appear here, so there's some sort of, of uh, reality, sophisticated reality associated with it. Okay, this is something that the Swedes had introduced a long time ago, some Swedes, okay? And now, the nice thing about it is that you have an additional set of operators made up again of the same things, and, and their advantage is that they do not, the Carroll uh, operators are not affected by them, so you can use them, and they generate a rather large symmetry, which is SO8, which appears in this language in singling out SO6, SO2, and then the coset. And you don't have to remember these things, I just want you to 
So in four dimensions, if we apply this in four dimensions, we pick out the way it goes, you pick out the S from the SO8, the helicity group, which is SO2, and the rest is the R symmetry, okay? And then the, the superfield, the Viking superfield, you put a, a gauge index on it, you make, you make the components proportional to transverse coordinates, and then you find that the whole theory can just be summarized by the change of this superfield under a dynamical supersymmetry transformation. And since this is superconformal, everything follows. Okay, so this is rather simple. It looks almost like a covariant derivative, even though we've fixed the gauge. So you notice now that we have, you have a kinetic part, which has a transverse derivative, and you have an interaction part that doesn't. So you can do perturbation theory, you can do beautiful things, and that's n equals four Yang mills. Okay, this is, this is material that is kind of known. And, um, okay, now let us go to six dimension and see how that goes. In six dimensions, the SO8, what you do, the best thing you can do, in the S you take the SO8 and you extract half of the... So the transverse little group in six dimensions is SU2 cross SU2. And the best thing you can extract from this is half of, half of the spin, and the rest is the R symmetry, SP4 or SO5, depending which day of the week you, you, you talk about it. Okay? And you make a lopsided assignment of SU2 left. It has an orbital part, but it has also the spin part, but the right-handed does not. And this is, this is the underlying kinematics of the 2-0 theory in six dimension. And, you can, uh, and with this formalism, you can easily find very the kinematical, emphasis on kinematical supersymmetries, they obey all that stuff, etc. And, and that's fine. But now the dynamics, we have to talk about the dynamics. Now, if you take the components of this superfield as canonical fields. Canonical fields in six dimensions means that bosons have dimension two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, the eight bosons uh, uh, come into something that some people call the B field, and five scalars. Okay, and this guy is not the full anti-symmetric tensor, but it's either it's the depending on your conventions, uh, either plus or minus. Okay. And then you find yourself that you can only generalize, like, like one did for n equals 4, to the, di to the dynamical symmetry with only the free case. So basically all you have is the kinetic part, and that, of course, is a description, which people have done 10 years ago, uh, of the tensor multiplet of the 2-0 uh, theory, which corresponds to the non bugelstone excitations on the, on the brain. Okay? All right, so now the problem that we have with, the, the, with, with this is that nobody knows what the fundamental degrees of freedom of the 2-0 theory are. Now, one knows a lot about it. I mean, some of the creators and experts of it are in the audience, but let me make a few remarks. First of all, the B field is conformal in six dimensions, just like the A field is, is conformal in four. Namely, its energy momentum tensor is traceless. Okay, and then you have a nice coupling that was alluded to, which is the B field with a string current. Okay, but again, Nambu, uh, you know, the question is that that string current, in fact, is the one that appears in the, in the Copenhagen lecture. Okay, and, but the question, there's no non-abelian generalization, and about a year ago, or maybe a bit less than, than that, I heard a talk by a man called Cyberg, I don't know if you know him, is a... Uh, 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 he talked about the fact that, uh, you know, because this, uh, this is coming from topology and it's kind of difficult to, to think of it as a non-abelian thing, but okay, no. So, there it is. So now comes the thing I would like to, to say. So, one picture of the 2-0 theory is that you have a bunch of stacked M5 brain and squashed M2 brains. So you have, you have thing, it looks like a, you know, a ship from Star Wars, you know, these this, this things like this, you have and then you smash it, and you know these things which have rectangular like wings, and okay, and and what happens is that it's the this is where it goes. But we know so thi this is as you as you squash it, do you keep the string picture? I don't know. The second thing is that we know that two zero compactified on torus 
gives you n equals 4 super Yang mu plus S duality. That's, that, that, that is wonderful. But the question is, this guy, which we derived before, which we showed before in this language, where the heck are the gauge indices? The B mu nu cannot have gauge indices. Okay? But this guy, so therefore the question is, this is what I would like to say, what, what do we do? So my question is, uh, as the M2 brain is about to get squashed, the string currents are self-dual because the B field is self-dual. In other words, only those things are, okay? But now the question is, as the B field perhaps disappears or something, can we still think of a string current, purely string current, which is self-dual? In other words, forget about the B field, let's try to build out of that. And if we do, okay, uh, I, will s I will show you that it can be done under what circumstances, and that I think is a new idea, is a, is a sug sug suggestion that perhaps it is a path of understanding the fundamental degrees of freedom to, to build a transverse string current which is automatically self dual. Okay? So, in order to do it, you have to distinguish left and right. So, you have to introduce spinner spinners. You introduce spinners which transform left and right. And then you think of your string coordinates, transverse string coordinates in this language. And you think of them as being by spinners. And if you do that, half of them, this combination, chi, uh, by the way, pr dot n prime, for those of you who don't do string theory, it's derivative with respect to tau and derivative with respect to sigma. There are still some people who don't know that. Um, and, uh, and what happens, you have some that transform this way and the other one transform the other way. Okay? So what I did, I inputted this into the self-duality thing, and it's a complete mess. However, if you take one of the spinners to be constant, then the triplet part is, is kind of a messy, but the, 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 the left-handed triplet is whatever it is. The right-handed the right triplet, is, triplet is very simple, and if I want this to vanish for self-duality, all I have to think of is that these, these spinners are actually left movers. Because if I interchange dot and prime, I get zero. So therefore, what I'm kind of thinking of is that the left movers, uh, are the lambdas are left movers, and the row is constant. I don't know why, but maybe those actually for sure generate a string current. And the string current, the coordinates of the string are themselves by spinners. It's kind of nice. Now. So you want to generalize, and the question is, well, where were the gauge indices? Well, the natural thing that comes to mind is that the gauge indices are probably on the spinners, since the string currents, the, the string coordinates have no, no gauge in index, but, but you can sum over them. So therefore, the natural suggestion comes that these guys are like that. Then, then, something, then if you want to satisfy the kinematic supersymmetry, you stick this guy in a Viking Super uh, Viking, Viking or Viking? Viking. Viking superfield, okay? And then the question that comes up, and I don't know the answer, but I've been obsessed with this. By the way, physics, there's a lot of obsession in physics, okay? That perhaps this may be, may be telling you that, that this is so special to, uh, uh, to six dimension that this actually may be a path to this underlying variable. One thing interesting is that notice the, the magic property of SU2 you know, SU2 has two ways of doing it because of the inner automorphism. And so this lambda is here, but then the bar is there. So you still have that kind of structure. Uh, okay. But I don't know. So the question I would like to pose to this august audience is, could this be underlying variables of the 2, 0? Okay? And the only connection is that this is to, the, to a transverse string current. But clearly, these are desperate times. I urge you to read uh, Michael Douglas's... Um, um, KITP slides for, for, uh, from two, two years ago, where it's basically, it goes from desperate to very desperate to extremely desperate, and except that everybody knows it's an important theory. Okay, so that's it for my, thank you for listening to this. Well, now, okay, now we're going to go back to Nambu. So now I would, the, the, my last thing is Nambu Sensei. Sen sensei in Japanese means teacher. Okay, so let's go back to Luc Lavelli. And uh, we, so Luc Lavelli, uh, basically, as I said, he said, Nambu says it's a string. And Lou and I had started working on dual resonance model. We, 
we talk. But uh, the work had a great deal to do with symmetries and with amplitudes and SL SL2 2 C and all kinds of stuff, uh, stuff like like that. And so, with some trepidation, um, Lou very nicely said, uh, I, "I called, I talked to Nambu, and Nambu is going to meet us at lunch at the Quadrangle Club." <coughs> wow, <coughs> you know. Okay. Well. <laughs> I mean, by that time, I knew who he was. He was not just an infinite component guy. I mean, okay? And so we go there, and instantly, he's, he's completely interested in what we're doing. You know? And, and that kind of sets, up at, sets us at ease right away, and, and he volunteers to have us come, I mean, to listen to us, because we, were, we did not have any senior person. At, at, at NAL, and it was like talking to a, not not talking to a, to a father, but talking to a, to you know somebody of your own generation, and he was, you know, he was just just fantastic. So right away we start talking about what we're doing, and he says, very interesting, hmm? and then he say yes, he said no. I didn't know how to read Japanese at the time. I had no idea. Peter Freund told told you how to read. Uh, Japanese, but, but he was very encouraging. I mean, he, he was not specific, but he was encouraging. And that was fantastic. And then, I mean, something for me, cheap as I am, he paid for the lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, I mean, it should have been dinner. Okay. <laughs> well, so in the intervening year, we go, we go and talk to Nambu, to Nambu and uh, Nambu always encourages. I've never heard him to be discouraging, although sometimes I did not understand when he was actually discouraging. <laughs> but I, but uh, that was good about the Japanese, that you don't, if you don't understand that, you're okay. You think he's very encouraging. <laughs> okay? And so in the uh, fall of 1970, I mean, after I spent a summer in Aspen and started thinking again, about wave equations, mostly because of this encounter with Nambu. I mean, I didn't realize the connection, because, you know, in those days, most people in Venetian models were talking about amplitudes. Amplitudes, 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 okay? But, but you know, equations uh, were kind of important, I thought. But anyway, so as I'm progr progressing in, in doing first for the boson, then for the fermion, this thing, I went to the institute, because in the fall of 1970, um, uh, uh, Nambu was spending the fall at the IAS, and I went to ask him. And again, I got a very encouraging, and this time it was more than encouraging. He, he was definitely very positive, you know, he said, yeah, this is very interesting, etc. And I came away com completely happy with this, and both he and Mandelstam actually were very encouraging. And, and that, but, that, but the fact is that I went there to ask his advice. That's what I mean, Nambu Sansei, because this was somebody. Who now, in 1980, when I left uh, 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 um, California, moved to Florida, who do I ask? Nambu again. And Nambu tells me about when he and Nishijima went south and, and developed their own group there. And he said, as long as you have the right people, his idea is as long as you have the right people, it's going to work. Okay. And then, in 1998, this has to do with, uh, this is a bit of neutrino physics, so I have to apologize. Uh, not really, but anyway. And so I am giving a talk at, in Trieste, and, uh, and a, a few months before, Sandeep Pagvasa, who is a historical freak, not, no, I don't mean that, he's, he's a freak about history, he's not, a, he's not, okay. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, excuse me, that was wrong. Okay, tells me about the history of uh, around Sakata and when the, the, the two neutrinos uh, thing was found, and, and the second was found, uh, these people, Maki, Nakagawa, and Sakata, had actually written the mixing matrix. At that time, this was very shortly after, after Gelman and Levy introduced the Kabibo angle, for example, which, which Lars talked about. And, and uh, then uh, what happened is that uh, Nobody talked about it because everybody talked about Ponte Corvo. So now let me tell you. So Ponte Corvo, uh, when basically people were trying to find neutrinos coming out of reactors, not finding them, although there were rumors that Davis had found one very early on. Okay, the question, this was in the days of Germán Pais Kekebar, which now we call entanglement. 
Um, and uh, uh, basically, the idea of oscillation between neutrino and antineutrinos was what Ponte Corvo was talking about, but this was flavor oscillation, very different. Okay? And these guys talked about it, so I, during the talk I gave, I mentioned these guys. And then after the talk, I'm surrounded by angry Russians. Okay? I mean, really very bad. I mean, if you have ever been surrounded by angry Russians, you'll remember it. And, and I didn't quite know what I'd stepped into, but they said, what about Ponte Corvo, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, he was doing the, the other type of oscillation, but it's true, he introduced the idea of, of, of oscillation. And then Nambu comes over, and, and he looks at me, and he shakes my hand, and he doesn't say anything, and he leaves. <laughs> that was a highlight of the conference for me. Okay. Now, so finally, three things. One, where was Nambu Copenhagen? Well, I, he was in Wendover, Utah. And um, what he had done was that uh, he was with his son, I, I think, uh, yeah, he was with his son, and somehow their car was passed in a rather obnoxious way, obnoxious way by somebody else, and very unnumbu like probably to impress his son, he just gunned his car, <laughs> and then the car broke down. <laughs> So they, they had to order parts and everything else, and so he was stuck in Wendover, Utah, which, as you may know, is just at the border between Utah and Nevada. It's, uh, and okay. Now, back to this, um, another side to Nambu. So in 1975, when we were in Paris, um, in those days, um, there is, there's a church uh, close to the, to the Luxembourg called Saint-Sulpice with very beautiful organ. And, and in those days, there was a person called Marie-Claire Alain, who was probably the world's best organist at the time, and she practiced very often there. So I asked people, do you want, let's, talk, let's take a walk. The only person who came with me was Nambu. Unfortunately, <laughs> Marie-Claire Alain was not there, <laughs> which was terrible. But anyway, in the process, I had a discussion with him about the fact I asked him, what does it take for somebody of your age to be collaborating and leading the pack and not making a difference. I mean, you don't make us feel old or young or something, you know. You, you, you're one of us, and etc. And he, he, didn't, he said, well, you just do. I mean, he, he, he was very nondescript. He just said, well, you just do what you do. And that was him. He was no, uh, there was no, um, no pretense about him. But, of course, whatever you read... That was kind of amazing. So, so we went to, to hear the Gonzal, but the Gonzal, there was nobody playing, and Marie-Claire Alain, God knows where she was. Okay. And finally, I want to finish with a little vignette about the, no, the Nobel in Chicago. Now, Tom Kerr tried to have attended the Nobel ceremony here when, that was when the Swedish ambassador came, etc. Um, I thought it was, it was rather, rather nice because it also ha underlines... Um, um, it's, a, it's a signature event. As, as they say, in a, in a food trade. Uh, so what happened is that he gives this little speech. So, well, the ambassador, you saw the picture, the ambassador gives the medal, et cetera, et cetera. And then as Nambu, Nambu is given the medal, but then he's about to give a talk, so he puts the medal aside, okay, a little bit behind the podium, and then he gives his talk, and then everybody applauds, and then he leaves, but he forgets the medal. <laughs> so there is a... a the, I think it was the, the Zimmer or somebody uh, the, who basically goes after him with the medal. Please don't forget your medal. <laughs> I mean, I thought that was very, very typical. So I just want to finish with one thing. The greatest honor Nambu gave to me was that for my 60th birthday, uh, one year ago, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he came and that was a, a singular thing. He was part of the family in many ways, but he hadn't met my three daughters, and, and there they were, and there, there he was, and he had flown to Japan, from Japan, just, just for that at that time, and I thought that is something I will cherish for the rest of my life. Anyway, one of the great things about this business is that you get to meet extraordinary people, and, with, and you, kind of, you kind of see what the human mind can do, and this is so beautiful, and this is so, so great. So I'm so happy to be here to honor this great person. Thank you.